So ROS1 is actually of one of the newer um, targeted agents. So this is a really nice timeline actually from 2017. So things have even changed since then, but um, you can see that really this is a new target. Um, the FDA approval was, there it is, 2016 <laughs> for crizotinib. So it, it's really only been a few years since we've even had an FDA approved targeted agent um, for this target. So I'm going to focus now on first-line therapy, um, and we'll go over just some of the drugs, um, the possible drugs, as well as the main standard of care, and then I'll talk about what to do after resistance on first-line therapy, and then some kind of general principles. So crizotinib is, as we mentioned, the main standard of care for first-line therapy with ROS1, um, and it's very effective um, in you know 70 to 80 percent of people the tumor actually shrinks and the disease is controlled in you know 90 percent of people um, the issue with crizotinib is really that we're not sure how well it works in the brain um, and the toxicity is mild to moderate most common toxicities are leg swelling um, GI toxicities like diarrhea, um, and then some kind of interesting visual symptoms. Um, so I think, you know, the bottom line for crizotinib is it is still the first line um, standard of care, but there might be some better things coming out that might have some better activity in the brain as well. Um, so seritinib is another drug that you may have heard about. Um, in, when it was tested in patients that had never had any therapy, um, the tumor was, uh, was shrinking in about 67% of patients, um, and again, good disease control. Um, it didn't work as well in patients that had had um, crizotinib in the past, um, but it did actually show that um, it had some activity in the brain. Um, the toxicity is a little bit higher than crizotinib, um, but they noticed that you could mitigate some of that if it was taken with food. So I think the bottom line for seritinib is it could be a good first-line agent probably not gonna be a great agent to use after crizotinib. It does have some activity in the brain and it is a little bit more toxic. So it's probably not something that we're gonna see very prominently um, in the future. Um, Intrectinib is the, the next drug. Um, so this is a, uh, again, a first line therapy with good results um, and good uh, responses in the brain as well. Um, they did test it in a few of the resistance mutations, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the kind of in the next section. And it didn't work as well for some of the resistance mutations, but it may actually be a good first line option in the future. Um, probably not going to be a great second line option, um, but it does have good activity in the brain. And this is actually a drug that's still pretty early on in development, so there are still trials that are ongoing. Um, and I think the last one I'll talk about in kind of the first line space is brigatinib. Um, so this is approved already as an ALK drug. Um, and they included really only three patients in the ALK study. So this is very limited, um, the three ROS1 patients. Um, and people that had had um, crizotinib in the past had I think not great responses, um, but people that had had no crizotinib in the past, actually, um, they did see a nice response. Um, it has moderate toxicity. It's probably not going to be the best first-line agent that we have, um, and it's probably not going to be very effective after crizotinib. So I, I don't think this will make a big splash in the ROS1 space. So now just talking about what to do after crizotinib, which is kind of in the, the general landscape where we are these days. Um, so what, what happens? Why does the tumor grow when um, it's being targeted by something like crizotinib? And it turns out that in ROS1, in about 50 to 60% of the cases, um, it's actually a new mutation in the pocket where the drug binds. So remember I showed those kind of like curly Q pictures of the two of ALK and ROS1, and it had pointed to a few spots. And some of those spots are actually where the drug finds its little pocket. And so what happens is that there's a mutation that develops in that pocket and the drug can no longer bind there as well. <clears throat> 
And so that's kind of, those are the types of mutations we're trying to develop drugs that can then fit better into the newly formed pocket. And actually 50 to 60% um, having mutations in ROS1 as the reason for resistance is actually pretty high among um, the driver mutations. So that, that's a, quite a bit higher than some of the other um, driver mutations and the reasons for resistance. Um, the most common is actually the G2032R, happens in about 41% of patients. So um, this is a list of a lot of the drugs I've talked about, but I think the column that I find most interesting and the, um, what I'll focus on next is the third column that has the G2032R and seeing whether any of those drugs have activity in the most common reason for resistance. So lorlatinib, this um, TPX005, which is actually has a new name, which I'll tell you about, and uh, cabazantinib. So we'll just talk about those three that might have activity in the most common reason for resistance to curzotinib. Um, so lorlatinib is the first one, um, and very exciting, gets into the brain very well, so I felt like we needed to highlight that. <laughs> um, and it does have good, um, in people that have already had resistance in curzotinib, it has good tumor shrinkage um, uh, in both the body and the brain. Um, it has some different side effects. Oh, yep, sorry. No, please. Okay, this might have been an early phase study. I'm not sure which which study that is. This might this is a small study of twelve, but you might be right that the that the. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, so that might be, they might have added some patients to that, so I appreciate the updated number, thank you. Um, so the side effect profile is a little bit different, um, having high cholesterol, high triglycerides, neuropathy, so numbness and tingling in the hands and feet, and then, um, you know, some swelling as well, mostly in the legs. Um, it's still too early, although there may be some emerging data on how effective this is in some of those resistance mutations that we looked at, um, but it does appear to be good in the brain, um, and as you uh, point out, it's, uh, the trials are ongoing. So uh, TAC005, um, which is, have been renamed as uh, ribotrectinib, um, is actually has activity across a lot of different targets, um, ROS1, ALK, and NTREC. Um, and it does seem to have activity in that most common mutation um, that's responsible for resistance to curzotinib. Um, the, the trials are ongoing. Again, uh, a lot of it is being run at MSK, and it's, it's really too early to tell. This is from one patient, and it's just highlighting um, on, the, um, on the left for the brain, circling some of the areas, um, brain lesions that then got quite a bit smaller after treatment um, for 12 weeks. And then the last um, drug I'll talk about is cabozantinib. Cabozantinib is actually used in cancer, but not um, in lung cancer as much. Um, and it is, I didn't put all of its targets here, but it actually targets even more things than the last drug. It targets quite a few, and because of that, it does have some added toxicity. Um, it does have activity against some of those more common resistance mutations. Um, and the toxicity, um, one of kind of the most visible is this kind of uh, redness and sometimes peeling of the hands and the feet, as well as GI toxicities like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and then also unique to this is high blood pressure. Um, and you know, the vast majority of people that were on these trials and even in um, practice that we see have to have dose reduction on this um, medication. So it does seem to be effective and it actually is available outside of a trial for um, patients that have some of these resistance mutations, um, but it's, it's fairly toxic, so that limits our use, although it's certainly available. Um, I thought this was a nice summary. Um, Kind of on the left are some of those mutations that show up. And again, these are things like um, Dr. Borgai was telling that, that might show up if you um, do a rebiopsy at the time that the tumor is, shrink is um, growing, 
or if you do a liquid biopsy, as Dr. Agarwal was talking about, these are some of the things that you might find. And so this, again, highlights the importance of figuring out what the resistance mutation is at the time that the tumor starts to grow. Um, and so on the left are some of the mutations you might find, and then in the middle are um, some of the drugs that have preclinical activity, so meaning when they did the studies in a petri dish, um, not in patients, they found that um, there was some activity using those drugs, and then as we're moving more into the clinical space, um, some of the drugs that actually have activity um, in patients. Um, this is kind of a way that um, the group up at MGH thinks about um, ROS1 uh, lung cancer. And it was created back in 2017, so there are some options, new options available now, but I think it still holds true. Um, so still first-line therapy once a ROS1 rearrangement is detected is crizotinib. They make a kind of caveat that if only one spot grows, you could consider radiation to that spot and then continuing the crizotinib, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to change treatment. Um, if there is real tumor growth, um, then it's time for a rebiopsy, either of tissue or um, a liquid biopsy. And then, you know, it, it splits usually about 50-50 for people with ROS1, whether the resistance is coming from the ROS1 um, uh, gene itself or is not related to the ROS1 gene. And so, um, you know, if it's the most common G2032R, um, then there are some uh, drugs available such as cabozantinib and some of the kind of uh, drugs and trials that we discussed. If it's a non-G2032R, then I would be going back to that table and looking to see which of those drugs potentially, yeah. Um, DS6051, I looked that up and it wasn't one that has a name yet, um, so I'm not sure that it's progressed as much in t since 2017. I don't remember, Char, do you know? I, I, I forget. Um, and then there's always the option of chemotherapy if there's nothing available to target, um, and I think just to make the point about immunotherapy, you know, immunotherapy um, alone is probably, is not listed on here and is, is probably not gonna be the best option, but potentially with chemotherapy could be an option in the future. Any questions? Yes. You mentioned for one of the drugs, uh, visual problems. Yes. Yeah, so um, with crizotinib, um, the visual disturbance that people usually, um, and maybe some people are nodding that, that, um, <laughs> that, that they've experienced it, um, and I'll try to explain it, uh, is basically a difficulty when you change from light to dark um, in accommodating that. So um, one thing that we usually advise patients is to be careful, especially immediately after taking the drug driving at night, um, sometimes being able to see lights at night is, it takes a little bit more time to accommodate. I don't know if you have a better explanation. I, had, I actually had light flashes at night when I would close my eyes to go to sleep. It would just be like a, like a neon light that would flash. Okay, so just to repeat that, light flashes at night also when you close your eyes, another thing people have experienced. Yes? Um, I actually have things that are described as those visual problems. Mm -hmm. themselves, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would that make me more at risk for taking a drug like Prozotin with getting those side effects, or are there different mechanisms if you already have them? That's a great question. I, I am not aware that having pre existing um, visual changes or migraines would make you more um, likely to get, to get those side effects. Yeah, I don't know if you have additional. I agree. Okay. All right, so this uh, presentation just demonstrates to you how far we've come in a very short time uh, with you know, developing new drugs in uh, ROS1, which is a very tiny subset of non-small cell lung cancer, but it's definitely one of those top five that we look for because we do have an FDA-approved drug. 
Um, I wanted to keep this session on app therapies very, very informal. I don't have a slide deck, but I do have some talking points that I will go through. But please, during the course of um, my talk, please feel free to stop me at any point in time. Um, so ALK rearranged non-small cell lung cancer is its own unique subset. And um, although the no, not the most common um, abnormality or mutation that's detected in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, it definitely has its own caveats and has established its own niche in the way we manage and treat uh, patients with this ALK rearrangement. So the things that I will talk to you about will be uh, detection, first-line treatment, second-line treatment, and really uh, what's emerging in terms of future therapies and resistance mutations. So to talk about diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer, as was highlighted in the previous um, talk, at the time of presentation, in addition to PDL1 testing, we are performing gene sequencing for mutations, including both the DNA and the RNA fusion panel. ALK is one of the things that can be tested um, and detected by various ways. I would like to highlight some of those for you. There is something very simple called as an ALK IHC or immunohistochemistry, where basically the tumor cells can just be stained for this ALK antibody. And if there is a high expression of ALK um, on the surface of the cancer cells, that can be positive by something called as ALK IHC. That does not necessarily mean that there is a fusion that can actually activate and cause uh, oncogenic driver mutation. So ALK IHC is sometimes used as a screening factor to really say, should this patient have subsequent ALK testing? I will just tell you that we have abandoned the use of ALK IHC because it's not a very good test to really tell us whether or not the patient has an actual mutation. So even if the ALK IHC may be positive, it may be that you know there's actually no mutation there and it's just the surface expression. So that's the first thing. And also the ALK antibodies are not very reproducible. And in fact, there was a shortage of the ALK antibody recently. So we at Penn have just abandoned the use of ALK IHC. We can look for the actual fusion with something called as a fish break apart assay. And that's really uh, been one of the most widely used techniques to use and uh, diagnose ALK. Um, if ALK fish is not available on the DNA panels, um, some of the liquid biopsy panels include the ALK fusions, and of course the RNA fusion panel that Dr. Baumel talked about in the previous presentation are sort of our uh, foolproof method to diagnose ALK. So once we find an ALK rearrangement, what do I tell patients? Well, firstly, if I have an ALK fusion, I do not look at the PDL1 level. As was highlighted in a previous talk, you know, if your PDL1 is 60%, 90%, as can be the case with an ALK fusion, we usually disregard the use of immunotherapy because firstly, we do not think that immunotherapy works as well. And secondly, we have a much better targeted therapy that can uh, control the disease, prolong survival, pro prolong progression-free survival, and penetrate the brain. So if I have a patient with an ALK fusion that's been detected, I usually talk to them about first-line therapy and what are our options out there for first-line treatment. So within the last um, eight years or so, or within the last 10 years, we have five drugs that are FDA approved now for the management of just this subset of ALK rearranged lung cancer. So we started off with crizotinib which was really the first drug uh, that was used for this disease. Then we went on to use a drug called seritinib, which was one of the second generation agents. Then we have a drug called electinib, uh, which is really our preferred drug, and I'll get to why that's our preferred drug. We have a drug called brigatinib, where we saw really good efficacy data recently. And then we have a drug called lorlatinib, which Dr. Marmorellis talked to you about, which also has activity in ROS1 disease. So where are we in terms of how do we choose between these five drugs that are available and out there? <clears throat> 
So 10 years ago or eight years ago, if I had a patient in my clinic with alk rearranged non-small cell lung cancer, I had crizotinib at my disposal and that's the drug I would use. And that was the drug that was the really the first drug to show superior activity compared to chemotherapy in the subset of patients. However, as we know, crizotinib does have its own set of side effects and is not the best drug to get into the brain. ALK rearranged non-small cell lung cancer is characterized by a slightly high likelihood of, going, um, of having metastases in the brain. So the brain component, as opposed to any other subset of lung cancer, is very important for us to be able to manage, control, and monitor. So as newer drugs came around, our management has changed. So we've moved away from using first-line crizotinib for ALK rearranged lung cancer. Seritinib was the second drug to be evaluated, and um, it looked like it was an effective drug when compared to chemotherapy. However, seritinib has a lot of side effects that can emerge from the treatment of seritinib, uh, the most common of which are GI upset as well as liver function abnormalities. I personally have had patients take seritinib. However, I have never been able to treat any patient at the prescription prescribed dose um, uh, that was prescribed uh, or is currently FDA approved just because I've always had to dose reduce because of liver function or GI issues. Having said that, serotonin doesn't really have a clear place in the management of patients with ALK-positive disease anymore just because we have newer drugs, which I'll talk about in more detail. I've gone to 300 as the most, you know, effective, but, you know, the best tolerated that I could get. I have not gone below that. Um, but my experience with seritinib has been thankfully limited because now we have better drugs that are available. So that leaves us with three new drugs. So electinib, brigatinib, and lorlatinib. So um, electinib is... Um, you know, another newer generation ALK inhibitor, which was really, uh, which came about to be our favored um, drug uh, after results of a clinical trial where it was compared head to head uh, with against crizotinib in the first line management of patients with lung cancer. And there were two, it was global studies, uh, the Japanese data were presented first, and then we saw the data that included um, North American population. And basically what we learned was that there was significant improvement in our ability to delay progression with the use of electinib over crizotinib alone. We know that with crizotinib, we were able to stall the disease or delay the progression till about nine to 11 months. However, with electinib, the first time the data came around, the median progression-free survival was greater than 24 months. And at the most recent reports, it's about 35 months. So this is not even survival. This is our ability to delay the appearance of a new lesion. But what was more striking was that even in the absence of targeted radiation to the brain, electinib in of itself was able to shrink tumors within the brain. Uh, and this level of blood-brain penetration we had not seen with crizotinib before or even with seritinib. It was much better tolerated. We did not see the same kind of visual issues. We did not see the same kind of GI issues. We did not see the same kind of LFT abnormalities. Based on all of these parameters of improvement in delaying progression, improvement in brain metastases, improvement in or delaying the appearance of new brain metastases and overall better tolerability, we easily adopted electinib as our new favored frontline therapy for patients with a positive disease. When this FDA approval came about, I had a difficult decision. You know, what to do with patients who had previously been pre placed on crizotinib? Do I go about changing everyone? Or what to do with patients who had been previously on seritinib? Now I have this new drug at my disposal. I know it's better. But what about patients who had been on crizotinib for nine months, 18 months, 20 months? I mean, there are certainly patients who had been on crizotinib for a long time. 
And really our uh, strategy at that time was that if there, if there was anyone who was really tolerating crizotinib or a first or second generation TKI well, at that time we would continue them on the same drug because we know that these new drugs are also important for resistance mutations. So hold on to that thought and I'll come back to the idea of reintroducing a, or introducing a new agent later on. But coming back to first time therapy now, in 2019, if somebody comes into my clinic, I will be starting them on electinib. However, I have another option now, which is brigatinib. So brigatinib is a newer generation ALK-TKI, which was also compared head-to-head -head against crizotinib in a recent study. And we saw very similar data to the to what, had, what we had seen with electinib. So brigatinib becomes another option for first-line treatment um, in non-small cell lung cancer. Brigatinib is currently approved for the second-line treatment already after failure of crizotinib. And I will remind everyone that after failure of crizotinib, electinib is also approved in sorcerotinib, but brigatinib is another agent that has been approved in the second-line setting. And recently, first-line data looked as promising, you know, you can't really compare trials to trials, but if we were to do so, it looks, you know, nearly as good as um, electinib does. So I talked to you about our favored approach. I think brigatinib is a, is a reasonable option. One specific thing about brigatinib is that it sets it apart, is that there is a specific comp component of pulmonary toxicity that can occur with brigatinib. And what do I mean by that? I mean that there are some patients that can develop lung infiltrates or, or shortness of breath uh, with the use of brigatinib. And in fact, the dosing of brigatinib has been uh, modified and tailored through the use of clinical trials in such an approach that uh, we start off at a slightly lower dose and then dose escalate up to the 180 that's prescribed with brigatinib. Um, so those are some very specific sort of side effects with uh, brigatinib, but overall otherwise seems very well tolerated. Um, the lung toxicity, is it a sort of a tolerance or you're weeding out the people that have the problem? I don't think we clearly know at this point in time, but it seems like if you, have, if you take a stepped up approach uh, that you can minimize the risk of pulmonary toxicity from appearing. But but for the same person, but there is, um, you know, a lot of um, activity in doing research around this drug in terms of what really is the mechanism. And in fact, a study at University of Colorado is looking at pre and post pulmonary function to see what really is going on. Um, so a lot of research going on in that area. Yes. Yes, so absolutely. So um, that's the next topic I was coming to. So thank you for queuing me <laughs> for that. Um, so lorlatinib is our latest drug on the block um, and actually is now FDA approved after failure of therapy um, in the second, third line setting. So uh, it's a really good invaluable tool to have and also we are blessed to have the FDA approval to be able to use it. Um, where do we use lorlatinib? So lorlatinib is the newest kid on the block. We use it uh, if there's somebody who's been on electinib or brigatinib or even seritinib and crizotinib and has failed their treatment. Um, there are, uh, a, there is a lot of interest in really defining which patients will benefit from lorlatinib versus which patients after they have been on a first or second generation TKI will benefit from electinib or brigatinib, sorry. Yeah. 
So I think that's a very, very, so those are two very important points that have been brought up. So the first point was uh, the brain penetration with these newer drugs, especially lorlatinib, and the second one was the side effect profile of these drugs. So I'll, I'll touch upon both of those. Yeah, go ahead. Hmm. That's actually a very good perspective to have, um, because as you may be aware, we don't have a lot of patients currently on lorlatinib. Um, you know, we are blessed that patients who started electinib have been able to remain on that for a while, but there is a very few select group of patients who are currently on lorlatinib, so having this perspective is very helpful. Um, but what sets lorlatinib apart is this activity in patients who've, who have uh, had mutations, especially after the use of a first-generation TKI, meaning uh, crizotinib. So lorlatinib uh, does have significant brain penetration where without the use of a radiation modality, be it SRS or whole brain, we are able to see shrinkage of these brain lesions in a very similar fashion that we saw with electinib. But these are patients that have even previously failed electinib and now are responding to lorlatinib. So it really gives us the opportunity to be able to add yet another ALK agent at the back end. So I, um, I did have one patient where I jumped from electinib um, to lorlatinib and then did not have, um, unfortunately, a significant response. And actually, the, uh, we could not find a mutation either by tissue or by blood uh, to be able to specifically direct therapy. And as, um, you know, sort of like a last-ditch effort, we tried brigatinib because brigatinib was approved by that time. And unfortunately, we did not see a response. So I think there's a lot that we have to learn about sequencing therapies. We're getting some um, signals from the most recent publication from Dr. Shaw about resistance mutations and how they may impact our choice of subsequent therapy. But I think this issue is very real of where do you go next? Uh, I don't think we have an answer. That's great. But did you did they detect an actual mutation or was that? Um, I had an additional mutation, but not one of the famous ones. Okay. Okay. On liquid biopsy or on tissue? Just curious. Tissue. On tissue. Okay. So I will just echo that that's a national effort, and that's a trial that's um, sponsored and funded and supported by the NCI. So there's a lot of effort. It's, it's multi-institutional. It's collaborative. And really the goal of that is to really just understand what we talked about, how to sequence therapies, how can we really look at resistance mutations, which therapy to go to next. Um, and there's a lot of very good investigators that are putting their time and effort in developing these drugs and developing this protocol. 
There is another protocol that is being uh, sponsored by the Bonnier Dario Lung Cancer Foundation. It's called ALCME, uh, where basically they're looking at the use of liquid biopsies um, as a tool to really detect mutations. Um, it's sponsored by the Adario Lung Cancer Medical Institute. So I think that's something else that's out there that you should be aware of that's available and a resource to patients. And it's called Space Walk. Yeah. 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 Um, but, Yeah, so, um, you know, MET, um, there is some activity that crizotinib has against MET, um, has against ROS1 also. Um, there is potentially a role of combining therapies, nothing that's widely used. If there is already a pre-existing MET amplification that travels along with the ALK rearrangement. I have not seen any reported recent case reports on combination therapies that have been successful. I know of emergent metamplifications that have come on while patients are on ALK therapies, but not something that's been pre-existing and sort of travels along. Um, the, a word of caution about things that are pre-existing and things that emerge, they may be passenger mutations versus driver mutations, meaning that there may be a mutation that pre exists and just travels along with the actual mutation, which we call as a passenger. There, or it may be a slightly, I mean, a met amplification may not necessarily be a driver. Sure. I was talking about, let's say, a meta amplification, which is not really a meta exon 14 skipping mutation, for example, and meta amplification may just be a passenger that's driving along and or is is, is pa passengering along and is not really driving the the tumor. But that's the something that emerges. Sure. So what I'm describing as a passenger um, usually is not in the driver's seat, is not really driving the, the tumor. It would not be identified as a driver necessarily for that disease. For example, there may be mutations that have known to be oncogenic in other tumors, but we are finding it in lung cancer. And we, so it may be, so there are some nuances to that. Exactly. So it may be oncogenic in another cancer, but not necessarily. So met amplification, met amplification has been shown to be related to lung cancer, but I, I'm not sure if met amplification alone is enough to be a driver, so as much as met exon 14 skipping mutation. Could it be No, that would be a completely different sort of uh, mechanism of the way the gene is being mutated, so to speak. Uh, Melina, you have something to add? Yeah. 
So amplification is basically excess copy numbers of of the gene that we are talking about. So it's you know having three instead of one or having eight instead of one. Um, that's really what amplification is. It doesn't really mean that the that particular gene is mutated or deleted or translocated or inverted or fused in any way. It just means that there are more copy numbers of it. Is what we classify as amplification. So it's a, it's a very hot topic for research in lung cancer because we know in EGFR mutant lung cancer, MET can be amplified at the time of resistance. Um, but MET in itself can also be mutated, um, what we call as a MET exon 14 skipping mutation, which becomes sort of like it's completely different subset. So I think to your question of, you know, would you do something about MET in terms of an additional therapy I don't think we have a clear answer. There have been case reports of an emergent RET fusion in patients who've been on ALK therapy, and they have benefited from combination. Or there have been um, emergent cases of ALK on patients who have had EGFR. So very interesting things that we are finding where therapies have been combined. I just don't have a clear answer for the MET story just yet. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's a that's a very good question. So, um, you know, there is a certain threshold um, where the test reports um, result out a particular mutation, and it's different for each test. It basically draws a line in the sand and says, if your circulating DNA is above a certain threshold, we will report it on the clinical report. However, there are patients who have slightly lower circulating DNA than that threshold that they've set. What I would like to see is that, you know, we lower those thresholds and make the tests even more sensitive so that even if there's a very few uh, copies of DNA circulating in the bloodstream that we are still able to report on them. You know, they're able to detect them. The levels of detection are very low now with these n new technologies, but the level of detection and the reporting level, there's a large gap. So when we read a negative report, it doesn't mean that there's no circulating DNA. It just means that it may have been floating at a much lower level than the test company feels comfortable reporting out. So what I would like to really see in the future is the levels of reporting go down as our tools become more sensitive. And it could very well be the case that the mutation is there. It's just does, it's not something that we have seen enough of or know m much about. For example, even the G1202R mutation, that's now you know, the most common mutation we look for and have the most experience with. We didn't know anything about that five years ago, right? So it's, it may be just that we just don't have enough information or enough trials, and that's... I think both. As the panels become larger, our ability to be able to sequence that particular spot in that gene, the ability becomes better, but also uh, that when, we, when these reports come in, then we can actually pool our data together and actually see what happens to that particular mutation. Um, so I think it's a little bit of both, and you know, our improvement is improving, but also um, to stress that the liquid biopsy panels may not be large enough to be able to get those, so tissue biopsy may be extremely important in these cases, especially in ALK. 
sure. Um, so I'll answer this and I'll come to your question. Um, so as we have these five drugs now, I think our, our use of chemotherapy has decreased significantly, at least in the upfront management of these patients. However, I do think that chemotherapy has a much, much more defined role than immunotherapy does. Drugs like Elimta or Pemetrexid specifically have been shown to have a uh, very good efficacy in patients who have had um, ALK-related lung cancer. Uh, for my patient experience that I discussed with you, uh, where lorlatinib didn't work and brigatinib didn't work, actually Elimta was the drug that worked after that. Um, the reason why we didn't choose Elimta first was we were trying to really avoid using an IV systemic treatment when we could use a pill, which was going to be presumably slightly better tolerated. Uh, but having had patients who receive Elimta all the time, because of the lack of a mutation, I can say that Elimta is also very well tolerated compared to some of the taxanes. And it definitely has a role, I would say, much later lines of therapy, not so much up front. Would you agree, Melina? Similarities. So I think it's worthwhile trying the uh, Pemetrexid because squame may be a component of the tumor or maybe just one specific no, area. I, I think you would still... I mean, why doesn't it work for the squamous? Could it work for the squamous algorithm? What is the idea behind So it has to do with, the, with an enzyme called thymidylate synthase. Um, thymidylate synthase is basically an enzyme that um, is very, very high in squamous uh, tumors, and it basically inhibits the use of you know, efficacy of Elimta. And that's the reason why it doesn't work in small cell, it doesn't work in squamous. Um, I mean, it has been tested in squamous, it just doesn't, I mean, it works, but it wo doesn't work as well. So the ALK is just like a side thing, the histology is actually more important. I think so, yes. I, I don't want to forget about your question. I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, our traditional standard of care approach usually is to start with the FDA-approved dose and then dose reduce in case of toxicity. Thankfully for electinib or brigatinib, we haven't been, you know, for brigatinib, we usually go up to the FDA-approved dose. However, for let's say electinib, we have not been a, we have not really needed to reduce the dose, which is distinct from serotinib. You're on reduced dose, okay? Because of fatigue or liver, okay? So um, I I have had one patient where I've had to reduce the dose for electinib, and that was for really horrible fatigue. The patient just could not function um, at the prescribed dose and is now on 150. Um, and I think. Twice a day. So three times a day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, the, the real driver in that case was fatigue, but for the most part, we were able to get by with the, um, with the prescribed dose of electinib, which is not the same for serotinib, for example, where we always had to dose reduce. And then we usually go back to what has been the experience on the phase one trial. You know, all these drugs were tested in phase one trial and where patients were uh, dosed on an on an escalated pat in a uh, escalated pattern, and really my justification for dose reducing uh, serotonin, for example, had been that there were responses seen even at 150, 300, 450, 70. Like you know, it, on that uh, trial, there were responses seen at each dose level. It wasn't that 
responses weren't seen. It's just that they found that the maximum tolerated dose or the maximum threshold that they could reach with um, that drug was, was a particular level, which then they decided to take into phase two. So not necessarily. So more is not necessarily better in terms of targeted therapies. You know, we certainly have EGFR patients who are on, you know, who used to be on doses as low as 50 milligrams of Tarceva when the actual dose was 150, and they were able to tolerate it beautifully, but also have the same efficacy as you would expect with 150. So I would say that with targeted therapies is more of a function of what is the minimum dose that's required to inhibit the, the receptor engagement at that point. I don't know, Melina, if you want to add something to that. Just, oh, go ahead. No, please ask your no, and then if there's progression, go, okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I think one thing to keep in mind is kind of how they find these doses, and Dr. Agarwal was talking about that a little bit, but, you know, in the phase one trial, they basically dose escalate until the point that the side effects are too high, and then they usually kind of go down just a little bit, <laughs> and then they test that dose for efficacy. And so it's not as though they picked the most effective dose. They picked the dose that was just barely tolerated. Um, and so it's an unfortunate reality of, of, of drug development. But, um, and then the other thing is with these TKIs, um, you know, everybody has different enzymes. Everybody has different, um, you know, amount of disease. And so the dose for you is not the dose, you know, for another patient. Um, and we're learning that, I think, um, slowly. Um, and I think being more liberal about dose reducing um, knowing now that there's not usually a drop in efficacy. Um, and they've looked at this for some of the more toxic TKIs, so, and we're not in the EGFR room, but um, a fat nib in particular is, was harder to tolerate. And so they looked at actually the half dose and saw that patients did just as well if they were on half the dose. Um, so it's not part of the label, so you can't, you know, really say that you can start at half the dose, but, um, you know, in the real world, people on that lower dose actually do just I say that I actually don't think there's good evidence to prove that um, but that's just kind of a gestalt that that we use but I don't, I don't actually think there's good data to say that that's actually true yeah Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, generally, you know, we do see the most toxicity at the beginning. Usually we say the first six weeks, but toxicity can ebb and flow. And so it's not impossible that a year down the road, a, a rash could pop up or things like that can happen, certainly. Um, but generally we see the most toxicity in the beginning. You had a question. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is how does the calculus change when we have CNS involvement? I think a lot has to do with this, the extent of CNS involvement, the size, and the symptoms. So those are the three things that we look at. If they're very, very small foci that we are seeing on a brain MRI, and the patient is completely asymptomatic, and um, you know, I'm anyway changing therapy to a more potent blood blood penetrant drug. I'm more likely to say, let me switch the patient to electinib or lorlatinib at this time and not do anything about the brain. So asymptomatic small lesions, I'm more comfortable with just using the TKI that has better blood brain penetration as my line of attack. 
However, if there is a bigger mass or if there's a mass that's causing, um, you know, shift of the a shift or symptoms or, you know, potentially, um, uh, you know, a, a mass that can compromise functionality or motor function, um, then we certainly bring in both our neurosurgical colleagues as well as radiation oncology colleagues to consider local therapy, be it surgical resection or the use of stereotactic radiation therapy or gamma knife uh, to control that in addition to using a blood penetrant drug. So I, I, I don't think there's a clean cut answer. I think it has to do with size, location, and symptoms. So you're really asking about the dosing question with these uh, drugs in the presence of new brain metastases. And I think this uh, phenomenon of increasing dose is much more prevalent in EGFR mutant disease, where with the older drugs, we were able to use something called as a pulse dose phenomenon or pulse dose technique, where we would take uh, a higher dose of Tarceva. So instead of giving a daily dose of 150, we would say, let's just take 1,500 once a week, and that would potentially increase blood-brain penetration. There have been a few case reports of using this with ALK-directed therapies as well, um, something that we don't commonly use at this point in time, just because if this is happening um, on a first or second, first generation TKI, we usually go to electinib or lorlatinib, or if it's happening with electinib, we think about going to lorlatinib at that point in time. So I haven't personally dosed uh, escalated just for brain disease yet. I, I'm on it. Okay. <laughs> so how much dose are you on now? And how is that working out in terms of tolerability and? That's great. So in terms of your first question about tolerability of these ALK agents, I think, uh, you know, there's a member in the audience who, who attests that, you know, this seems like a safe and well-tolerated approach. I think the, the thresholds of the increase will be different for different drugs. Yeah, so the thresholds will be different. And I don't think at this point I feel comfortable just going to 10 times of a dose without really having some kind of evidence behind it. The reason why we were able to use the 1,500 milligram dose for Tarceva was because of published, you know, peer-reviewed um, and vetted experience with that dose. And that, that's how it became a little more universal in terms of its applicability. But I will remind you that it, that use has gone away with the use of osimertinib. Uh, but there is some evidence that even increasing the dose of osimertinib may help with brain uh, metastases. So instead of going 80, you go 160. So it's not really 10 times, it's sort of like doubling um, the dose. Again, uh, the Tarceva pulse is 1,500. It sounds like it's a 10 times, but it's a once a week. So, you know, instead of 750, you're going to 1,500. Right. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And if they're not, then we do have other modalities like radiation therapy or gamma knife which can attack it. But I don't think we, we think about it like we're not going to treat it because there are other things that are going to come up. It really depends on the location and, you know, what the operability is at that point in time. I think it's a discussion to be had in a multidisciplinary fashion. Uh, really, there are definitely, you know, real surgical mor morbidity that can happen with neurosurgery, but there's also some memory issues and cognitive issues as well as the um, uh, as well as the side effect of potential radionecrosis with radiation. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's sort of like a discussion that needs to be had really in a true multidisciplinary fashion. And I think there was a question there in the back. Yeah, I, well, again, it's sort of going into what some others have mentioned. You know, this whole sequencing of the drugs and the timing on drugs. I know, for example, you know, if you've been on another TKI and then go to another one, you don't, it doesn't appear that you get as long out of it as you would if it, you, it was the first line treatment. Like, if you go to Lerlantin at first versus being sick, just, I'm from it, I, they're elected at first and then going to Lerlantin. So I'm, I'm always struggling in my own mind, and I don't know if there's, there's no hard and fast answer. Are you better to squeeze as much out of each one by increasing dose or doing what they call weeding the garden, you know, if you have a few metastases, you just take care of them through radiation or something. Stay on it for as long as possible while it's still working overall and then moving on versus just moving on. And with that, and I think that we all feel this, as I look right now at Lorlatinib as the end of the line, and to put that off as long as possible. Because I, I see it as the end of the line right now. Of course, there's chemo, but I'm just saying, you know. So, do you want to answer that? Or? So I would just, and I'll let Melina follow up on this, I would just say that, um, you know, what is a much better established practice is, uh, and what's currently endorsed by the NCCN is, in case of oligoprogression, meaning oligoprogression is basically oligo being few or limited and progression being progress progression, but if there's a few limited sites of progression, let's say you're overall doing great, but there's one tiny ditzel that shows up in the lung, or one tiny ditzel that shows up in the brain, what is a much better scientifically proven approach, and the, that's uh, included in the guidelines, is to radiate that area of oligoprogression and continue with the therapy than to go on and increase the therapy. So I completely hear you, and we agree as physicians and providers that we want to get as much benefit as we want from one particular therapy. So if you're an electinib, I want to be able to get as much bang for the buck as I want. Um, and if you were to open the NCCN guidelines, in fact, you know, they say that there's one or two sites of disease, consider radiation and continuing therapy. Um, I don't think we have a lot of data in terms of increasing dose that can be scientifically translated into guidelines just yet. Um, I do think, and I certainly have patients who develop brain metastases on electinib, and I have you know, spot radiated or done gamma knife and be able to continue the electinib without really increasing the dose. So I do in understand the idea of increasing the dose, uh, but just not guideline-based right now. 
Yeah, no, I, I think I think definitely. I mean, I think you're talking about a pretty central lesion, so maybe like a lymph node in the middle of the chest that would be really close to the esophagus or something and would cause some of those. And the radiation oncologist should be able to go through the risks and the benefits of certain, you know, locations with you. So that's what I'm saying, this, this generalized concept of mm -hmm. in oligo progression, go to radiation, you would agree that it doesn't necessarily apply in the same force if it was somewhere like that that has we would, yeah, we would still consider it. We definitely would, and it's all about it's all about risks and benefits. Yeah, so you know, if you were really worried about the esophagitis or the risk of you know radiation pneumonitis, you know, it would be it you know it could be. It's certainly reasonable if, if the radiation oncologist feels that it's safe and technically feasible, then radiation to a, a one or two areas that's growing is certainly an option and is something to consider. And proton therapy may be able to reduce some of the overlap with, you know, the vital organs. If it's a very central lesion, they have uh, better stopping so that they are not affecting the heart or the esophagus. So I think there are ways to mitigate that risk of esophagitis or swelling of the esophagus or the lungs. So again, uh, I think it's still in the running for oligoprogressive radiation therapy being um, an option. So no personal experience to share, but again, I think it's one of the drugs which is, again, in the running for what will we do next after electinib or norlatinib. I don't have personal experience with the drug. All right, we are almost up on time. Thank you so much for a delightful, engaging, interactive discussion. We will be around if you have more questions. And thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. Thank you. Thank you.